Good day. The last 24 hours have been possibly amongst the most momentous, or at least some of the bloodiest hours in the Ukraine war, and one where there seem to have been quite important events happening on the front lines. But the most important events, arguably, have been taking place in the United States. And before I proceed, I should say that I perhaps am wrong in saying this, but it seems to me that U.S. officials, senior U.S. officials, members of the Biden administration, I sort of get the sense that they're talking less about Ukraine at the moment. I don't say that they've stopped doing so entirely. Uh, Defence Secretary Lloyd Austin has come out and has made another speech in which he says that the conflict in Ukraine is in some way strengthening the US economy. I, I'm not going to waste time uh, debating that, in my opinion, unbelievably bad point. But anyway, overall, we are starting to hear rather less about Ukraine from within the Biden administration. But a number of other things have happened in the United States, or at least, and we got the news about them yesterday, and they are in themselves perhaps more and more interesting. First is the entirely unexpected news that came out yesterday, that Victoria Nuland, the acting Deputy Secretary of State, is intending to resign. She's apparently submitted her resignation, it's been accepted, and she is leaving the US government. Now, Newland is one of these very interesting and remarkable people who appears to have wielded enormous influence and power in shaping US policy, even though she has never actually held elected office in the United States. And I suspect that she is probably unknown to the vast majority of the American people. That's not because, by the way, she's shy or um, hides or acts uh, in secret. In fact, she's a fairly brash individual, at least in her public persona she is, and she's very visible. But it's because she has always worked, ultimately, within the permanent government of the United States. Um, initially, she was a career diplomat at the State Department. I should say I'm not clear exactly when or how she joined the State Department. But then she experienced an inexorable rise through the ranks of the State Department. In the 1990s, under Bill Clinton's administration, she became chief of staff to Stove Talbot, who was in overall charge at that time, as I well remember, of US policy towards Russia. This was in the 1990s, when the United States was still trying to shape Russia to its purposes, involving itself deeply in Russian politics, supporting the so-called liberal reformers and Boris Yeltsin, against their adversaries, their political adversaries, um, working with various oligarchs, doing all sorts of things in Russian politics at that time. Anyway, she was um, a senior official within the uh, State Department at that time. She worked closely with Stoke Talbot. Then, during the succeeding George W. Bush administration, she became the senior advisor foreign policy advisor to Vice President Dick Cheney, um, a, an, a vice president with an unusually great degree of influence for a vice president over the direction of US foreign policy. And by universal agreement, Dick Cheney was one of the most hardline neocons in the government at that time. And then 
Newland continued to rise remarkably after the Bush administration left the scene. Um, she seems to have got on well with Hillary Clinton, who perhaps she got to know during her the earlier period um, during the Bill Clinton administration when she was working for Stoke Talbot. Anyway, eventually she became Assistant Secretary of State for European Affairs. She played, as we all remember, at least those of us who watch this channel regularly will no doubt remember, an absolutely central role in the Maidan events in 2013 and 2014. Um, she attended Maidan Square. She handed out cookies to the various protesters there, protesting against the constitutional and elected, democratically elected government of President, the then Ukrainian President, Viktor Yanukovych. She also um, was caught talking over the telephone and mobile phone, presumably by the Russians, um, picking the members of the future Ukrainian government that would replace Yanukovych. It's universally acknowledged that Newland played a central role in uh, facilitating the um, overthrow of President Yanukovych and the Maidan protests and in shaping the new government and its policies. And then, of course, uh, she left government when uh, Obama left the scene. She wasn't prepared to serve Donald Trump. Probably Donald Trump wasn't keen on having her in the US government either. But then, as soon as President Biden became president, she was back and she was eventually appointed uh, some months ago to the position of Deputy Secretary of State when the previous well-regarded um, person who'd held that post, Wendy Sherman, retired. And it's important to say that, the, that Newland's appointment as Deputy Secretary of State was never confirmed, but anyway, she exercised it. And then, somewhat mysteriously, yesterday, we got the news that she was retiring. Now, it's difficult to understand quite why Newland would want to retire at this point. She's just reached, achieved the promotion to the highest post that she's held up to this time. Deputy Secretary of State, um, if the Democrats were to win the election, the presidential election in November, she might have had hopes that she might be promoted further. I'm not saying, I don't know what her plans or ideas were, but she's played a major role, as the current Secretary of State, of State Tony Blinken, has said, in mobilising the support in Europe uh, behind the American-led project in Ukraine. And one would have thought that she would be anxious to see it through. I'm just saying. Maybe she's decided to go now because she's worried that the Democrats will lose office in November. But if so, well, why not stick it out until the inauguration of the new president in January next year. In other words, a year, of, a year from now, and do what she has always done, which is to try to shape Ukraine, Ukrainian policy um, during the remaining months that she remains in post. I have to say, I can't help but wonder whether she hasn't been told to step down. And that could be because we are now in the process of witnessing some kind of a sea change in US policy. I have discussed how that very strange article that appeared in the New York Times, 
a few uh, about a week ago, 10 days ago, discussing the CIA's operations in Ukraine and disclosing an enormous amount of information about those operations, which was um, frankly, well, would, one would have expected to be top secret, might be a sign that's, that some people in Washington had come to the decision that the moment had come to shut the whole thing down. And I've also um, said that with the deadlock in Congress continues, and I get to come to that in a moment, it looks as if the current of opinion within the United States government is gradually shifting away from this open-ended and intense commitment to Ukraine. It's not that the neocons in Washington have lost their hold over the government or that they have gone soft. It's rather that their primary focus is elsewhere, currently on the Middle East and on China. And they're also worried about the rise and rise of Donald Trump. More about him in a moment. And all of that is making them start to think that the moment has come to start walking away ever so slowly and gradually from Project Ukraine. I want to stress, I don't mean all the neocons, but perhaps the ascendant element within the US government at the moment. And I can understand why in that case a decision might have been made to tell Newland that it's time for her to go and to replace her with someone else. And the person who is apparently taking over from her as Deputy Secretary of State is John Bass, a career diplomat within the State Department who importantly was apparently in post managing in some form the US withdrawal from Afghanistan. Now, that's, to my mind, the best explanation for this that I can find. There may be others. It may be that Newland is retiring for personal reasons that I know absolutely nothing about. It may be that she's been offered a nice job somewhere else. But given her personality, I find it unlikely that she would leave the State Department, which has been her major place of power voluntarily and by herself and my best guess is and in the nature of things it can only be a guess is that more and more people within the pentagon perhaps the intelligence agencies the democratic party perhaps worried about the difficult election which is coming are becoming tired by his stridency and are coming round to the view that the time has come, however difficult that might be, emotionally and viscerally, to start tiptoeing quietly away from Ukraine. Now, if that is correct, then it is likely that there is an emerges, emerging consensus in the US at least in the political leadership of the US, that the war in Ukraine is being lost. There is no longer any serious hope or expectation that Ukraine can win or that Russia will be defeated. And there might be a desire, therefore, to distance the United States as far as possible from what is gradually coming to be recognised as a failing enterprise. Note, however, that there's no serious suggestion of opening any kind of negotiation track with Moscow. That remains taboo. Anyway, that's all I'm going to say about Newland.
um, a lot of speculation on my part. But the fact is that she has resigned and the man who is taking over from her, John Bass, appears to be a much more, shall we say, mainstream conservative figure than she is. Certainly not the kind of person with the kind of visceral commitment to Ukraine that she once had or to the particular set of policies that are associated with her. So that's one important thing that has happened in the United States. The other thing which has happened in the United States is the decision of the Supreme Court of the United States to reverse the decision of the Colorado Supreme Court, which had in effect upheld the decision to disqualify Donald Trump from standing in the Republican primary in that state, and ultimately, of course, the presidential election in November. Now, I think that the decision to reverse the decision of the Colorado Supreme Court is uncontroversial in legal terms and very widely anticipated. But what was very interesting and important about this decision is that the majority in the Supreme Court, five out of the nine justices, went even further. The decision to reverse the decision of the Colorado Supreme Court was unanimous, but a majority within the Supreme Court also went on to say that any disqualification of a presidential candidate under the insurrection clause in the 14th Amendment of the Constitution must, can only take place on the basis of some decision by Congress, decision that might be legislation, which defines the terms and mechanism whereby disqualification takes place, or possibly, in the case of a sitting president or a former president, some kind of impeachment process. Now, that was controversial within the Supreme Court. The three liberal justices strongly protested against that decision. Um, one other justice, Amy Comey Barrett, clearly was um, unhappy about the fact that the majority took that decision. And as Amy Comey Parrott and the Liberal Justices say, the Supreme Court did not need to make this further decision in order to grant Trump's appeal and to set aside the decision of the Supreme Court of Colorado. So why did they do it? Well, I think actually it is not difficult to work out why. There's been a large number of cases brought against Donald Trump, um, accusing him of all kinds of crimes and transgressions. And it's possible that there were more cases in the train. And it's also possible that the fear of the Supreme Court majority, and perhaps, perhaps just possibly, the hope of some members of the Supreme Court minority, is that at some point Donald Trump would be convicted of something, and that something, whatever it was, would be construed as some kind of violation of the insurrection clause in the 14th Amendment, Maybe the, the Florida, sorry, the Georgia case might be the specific case in point here. And that following that conviction, the Department of Justice would make an application to a federal court judge saying that the 14th Amendment applied to Donald Trump on the strength of this conviction, and he should therefore be disqualified from standing in the election. Now, I want to stress, I am not saying 
that that was the plan, the administration's plan, or the Democratic Party's plan, or anybody's plan. But had that happened, had that scenario acted out, well, of course, Donald Trump would have appealed, and those appeals would eventually have come to the Supreme Court, and it is likely that the Supreme Court, in that case, would have reversed the decision of the federal judge who made that order, but there would have been a deep political crisis in the United States. In the meantime, the election would have been thrown into massive confusion, and there might have been pressure on the Republican Party, even if by that point it had nominated Donald Trump to withdraw support for him and to find another candidate, say Nikki Haley, who is still contesting the election and who has some convention votes behind her, which of course no one else in the Republican Party does. So the Supreme Court majority wanting to avoid having the Supreme Court dragged into a crisis like that and doubtless worried about the wider effects on the United States if we find our, found ourselves in that kind of scenario, preempted that particular scenario by making it clear that action had to be taken by Congress before disqualification could take place. Now, that effectively precludes any possibility of Donald Trump being disqualified before the election. There is no possibility that Donald Trump can be impeached all over again on some, impe some insurrection-connected issue. There is certainly no majority for that, either in the House of Representatives. Uh, well, no majority for that in the House of Representatives. And I expect that Republican senators in the Senate would be solidly opposed and there would not be a two-thirds majority for that in the Senate. And it is all but impossible to imagine that Congress could pass legislation to make such a thing possible before the November election. The Republicans would almost certainly oppose it, and they, of course, have a majority in the House of Representatives. I would add that any attempt to do that would be obviously directed at Donald Trump and would be an unbelievably divisive act. And I can't imagine, even in this present overpolarized environment, that something like that will happen. So that means that Donald Trump, who is certain to become the Republican Party's candidate for the presidency, um, will uh, be able to proceed and will be able to contest the election in November as the Republican Party's candidate in the confident knowledge that he is able to stand in every American state as every other candidate for election in the, to the presidency has done at least in the modern era. And that is important for many reasons, but specifically on the issue of Ukraine. It is important because it means that the Republican Party is going to have a candidate who wants to end the Ukraine war, who is um, hostile to continued US aid for Ukraine, and that is already having an effect on the stance of Republicans in Congress, in the House of Representatives, and increasingly in the Senate. And, of course, the last piece of news from the United States follows from these two other things, specifically the second one, which is the Speaker of 
Johnson is now apparently resurrecting the idea of um, linking the issue of aid to Ukraine with moves on the border. So apparently he's instructed some people, uh, some representatives, Republican representatives in the House, to come up with a plan whereby the um, amount of aid for Ukraine is reduced by, I believe, something like $13 billion, $14 billion, from $61 billion to just, well, to $47 billion. But this, again, is linked to the border with the Republicans proposing action to bring the situation in the, on the border under control, action which, from what I've seen of what the proposals apparently are, I think the Biden administration would find all but impossible to agree to. Now, that doesn't mean that this, is, this, this question is closed. I suspect there will be a massive amount of horse trading and argument and discussion over the next couple of weeks and months, and quite possibly eventually we will get a vote and Ukraine will be provided by uh, a certain, with a certain amount of money. But it doesn't look as if that's going to happen before the end of April, <laughs> at the earliest, and it is far from a foregone conclusion that we will in fact even reach that end point of Ukraine being given more aid. Because, of course, linking the issue of Ukraine to the border is one that works well for Republicans and for Donald Trump. And that is why it is being done. Mike Johnson is not helping Russia. He's not actually averse, in my opinion, to helping Ukraine. What he wants to do is help Donald Trump win the presidency in November. And he also wants Republicans to win Congress, to win control of Congress, to retain control of the House of Representatives and perhaps gain control of the Senate as well. This is what this is all about. And Johnson knows that Americans are much more concerned about the border than they are about Ukraine. In fact, they're becoming increasingly negative about the whole issue of Ukraine. And um, Johnson, I think, calculates that this is a popular stance. And of course, if Biden makes the kind of concessions that Johnson appears to be demanding, then that will weaken Biden's position because he will anta antagonize some part of his electoral base. But if the president doesn't back down, well, Johnson can say, well, if there's a disaster in Ukraine between now and November, that's not our fault. That's not the fault of us in the House of Representatives. It's because the president wasn't prepared to make concessions, substantive concessions, on the one issue that is most important both to us and to the American people, which is the issue of the border. Now, it could be that Victoria Nuland, who must have a better understanding of American parliamentary politics than I do, um, sees it all in the same way as I do, and that this is one of the reasons she has come to the decision that she has. She knows that the flow of American aid to Ukraine is reducing, that opinion in Washington is starting to turn against the enterprise, that people can see that Ukraine is learning out of ammunition and weapons and air defense missiles and men. And 
with Congress taking the stance that it is taking. She's understood that the time has come for her to go. Now, I have to say straight away, I'm not absolutely certain about much of this, but I suspect that the Europeans, who are also fairly well attuned to what's going on in Washington, they have many, many friends there, probably do sense that this is what is happening. They can see the situation on the battlefronts turning out very bad. I'll come to that in a moment. And they can see that the war in Ukraine is being lost. And they can see the signs that the Americans are cooling and are starting to walk away. And this is why we have this incredible freak out that we see in Europe at the moment with all the talk about transferring Europe to a war economy. This is what the Danish government is now talking about. I don't think people who talk like this, by the way, in Europe understand quite what a war economy is. I just want to say that clearly. I think that this is another word or uh, uh, that they've stumbled upon, but I don't think they understand what it would mean if something like that were to be done in Europe. And all of the talk, the brave talk about increasing arms production, and defence production, and all of that in Europe, well, it's been underway now for two years, and it's not produced any, any positive results. I've seen some claims that Rheinmetall is increasing, increasing production of shells, but I have to say that numbers here are becoming very difficult again to get uh, uh, accurately. There were all sorts of claims, I remember last year, that the US had already increased production of shells and that they were running at 40,000 rounds of 155 millimeter ammunition a month. And then it turned out that this was not true and that the actual amount of shells that the United States is producing each month at the moment is no more than 28,000. And at the moment, again, we're getting stories that Rheinmetall is now outproducing the United States in shell production. But this flatly contradicts a lot of information I was getting or reading right at the end of last year, just a few weeks ago, in other words, which said that shell production in Europe was in crisis, that shell production was very fragmented, that though the Americans had been able to increase shell production, the Europeans had not been able to. So there is a lot of fog and confusion about all of this. But anyway, the overall story continues to be that weapons production in general in Europe is not increasing to anything like the level that would be needed to match Russian production or to meet Ukraine's needs, and that any idea of trying to sustain Project Ukraine without the United States is meaningless. We have all sorts of people coming up with all sorts of plans and schemes. Emmanuel Macron talking about sending French troops to Ukraine, but not obviously in some kind of a combat role. I mean, again, I want to just remind people what, how absolutely absurd that is. You send troops into a combat zone and say that they don't have a combat role. Well, it's fine for you to say that, well, what if the other side doesn't agree? What if they, say, they decide, as they say they will, the Russians have said that many times, that if French or EU troops enter Ukraine, they will feel free to attack them. What happens then? What does France do if that is what happens? What does Macron do? As I said, this is a scheme... <laughs> It is not, properly speaking, a plan.
But all of these schemes, all of these plans, all of these urgent summits that Macron is convening, all this excited talk, all these schemes, the German officers are discussing with each other, and Boris Pistorius, the German defence minister, is coming up with, um, challenging, by the way, the chain of command within the German government and going behind the back of his own party leader, Chancellor Olaf Scholz. All those plans to attack the Crimean Bridge with Taurus missiles, they are ultimately schemes. Without the United States, none of this makes any sort of sense anymore. So, it would not be the first time, I would say, in modern history, where the United States has led a coalition of allies onto some adventure. When I say the United States, I want to stress again, I mean the neocon faction that controls policy in the United States. Anyway, where they've led them on some adventure, and then the United States tires of the adventure and walks away, and its so-called allies are left hanging out to dry. And I do wonder whether this is what is happening and whether the Europeans are starting to sense this. And as I said, that's why they're freaking out. And by the way, last week when I spoke about panic, a wave of panic across Europe, more and more articles I'm now seeing in the European media, in the British media, saying exactly the same thing. The concept that there is panic and fear, that is continuing to gain force. And I have to say also that the situation on the battlefronts gives them more good cause for panic and fear. Because it is clear that Project Ukraine is indeed failing. Now, yesterday, as I said, was a particularly bloody day in Ukraine. And the worst casualties were in the Avdeevka sector. Uh, the Russian Defense Ministry reports that up to 500 Ukrainian soldiers were killed or wounded in the fighting in Avdeevka. That is a monstrously high total. And it builds on reports from the Russian Defense Ministry of hundreds of Ukrainian losses every day in the Avdevka sector over the last couple of days. Of course, people always remind me we don't know what Russian casualties are. And these are Russian Defense Ministry estimates for the record. I think as estimates, they are probably roughly correct, always on the understanding that we're talking about both dead and wounded. And, well, Russian casualties. We don't need to guess. Media Zone gives us a monthly breakdown. And again, that probably overstates the figure of Russian casualties, but they don't actually, media zone's numbers don't actually uh, support the claims of a huge spike in Russian casualties over the last few weeks and months. Just saying. Anyway, very, very difficult day in Avdeevka. I'll come back to Avdeevka shortly, but a very difficult day for Ukraine altogether. Now, I'm going to first of all return to the topic of the Ivan Kotov, the um, Russian patrol ship that the Ukrainians sunk um, off Feodosia. Um, apparently, up to seven um, seaborne drones were um, deployed against this one ship, which seems astonishing. Um, a, a source has provided me some in interesting insight about these drones. Apparently, according to this person, it's widely known that they're actually built in Romania, 
They're made in, manufactured in Romania. This is coming from Russian sources, I should say. That they're ma manufactured in R Romania to British designs, but they're actually armed when they're delivered to Ukraine, it, to the Odessa region. And um, there are apparently, the, the Black Sea has now been seeded with various um, guidance boys, which play a role in enabling links to be established as they approach the target that they're due to strike. Uh, most of the most of the uh, journey is pre-programmed, but it's these guidance boys, the, these relay boys, that make it possible for the Ukrainians, presumably with the help of some of their friends, to control the attacks as the target is reached. Now, seven drones seems a disproportionate number of drones to a to use against a relatively small patrol ship. I said in my program yesterday that the Ivan Kotov is a small ship, but one which packs a heavy punch because it is capable of launching Calibre missiles. But it's important to stress it's a relatively small ship. It's, as its name indicates, it's mostly a guard ship. It is intended to control or to provide pre prevention, protection to shoreline positions. It doesn't have heavy armament, the kind of heavy armament that a proper missile corvette or a frigate would have. So it does seem excessive to send that huge number of drones to attack it. Well, I've seen that Reba, at least, this is one of the major Russian commentators about the conflict, he's actually suggested that the Ivan Kotov was not the ultimate target. The ultimate target was, again, the Crimea Bridge, the Kerch Bridge. That is why all of these drones, seven of them, were launched in this direction. The point of the, Eva, of the Ivan Kotov is that it was one of the various patrol ships and other craft and other barriers that the Russians have created to protect the Kerch Bridge from this kind of attack. And if that is correct, then what I would say is that the attack failed. The Russians lost the Ivan Kotov, though apparently all the crew was saved, but the Crimean Bridge still stands. In a recent programme, Alex Christoforo and I pointed out the strange obsession, the unhealthy obsession, that the Ukrainians, and the British in particular, who seem to be behind all of these attacks, I've discussed Admiral Radikin's role in previous programs, seem to have with the Crimean Bridge. And I wonder, actually, whether this latest attack is just another expression of it. Just saying. Before I proceed, I just do want to say something further about Admiral Radikin and about the role of the British Navy, the Royal Navy, in these operations. And it's important to say, and it's not, I think, widely understood, that the British military overall is in a state of deep crisis. It's had to battle with funding cuts, effective funding cuts for some time. Um, spending has been distorted by the need to maintain Britain's nuclear deterrent. The army has been significantly reduced in size. We've had problems operating the deterrent as well. There's been that very great embarrassment of the attempted Trident launch, missile launch, that failed to work. We've also had multiple problems with other warships. The Queen Elizabeth carriers have never been 
um, equipped with the aircraft complement that they need. They suffer from perennial engine and mechanical problems, I suspect, because um, funding shortages mean that the bugs that afflict all warships, all of these kind of ships, have never really been solved or attended to properly. There are problems with other warships as well. The HMS Diamond, which was sailing around the, the Red Sea alongside the Americans. Apparently, there were concerns that it was vulnerable to attack by the Houthis, and it's had to be pulled back. And it turns out that there are now problems also with the Royal Air Force, which has had to scrap 35 of its Typhoon jets because there isn't money to upgrade them and there aren't pilots to fly them. So the British military is actually in bad shape. It's also had the embarrassment of two unsuccessful wars, one in Afghanistan and the other in Iraq. In both of these wars, the British faced the humiliation of coming under overwhelming pressure from the insurgencies in both of these countries, in Helmand and in Basra, and needing the Americans to come to their rescue. So, for the British military, conducting military operations of this kind against the Russians is, I suppose, a way both of trying to rebuild their confidence but also of convincing the politicians that they are relevant and that they merit extra funding. And I suspect that behind a lot of the belligerents in London, amongst the soldiers and the seamen and people of that kind, there is this need to battle for funds at a time when British finances are overstretched, severely overstretched, and when the government, the Sunak government, as it has shown in the budget today, is prioritising tax cuts over extra defence spending. I'm just saying. Anyway, to continue, probably, therefore, an unsuccessful attack on the Crimean Bridge. But what we got in the hours that followed was an overwhelming Russian uh, drone and missile attacks right across Ukraine. Um, Odessa, in particular, was severely pounded. Some people think that this was a retaliation to the attack on the Ivan Kotov, which it might have been, but it's more likely that it was planned long in advance. But also, massive assaults by the Russians right across the hunt front line with devastating results. Now, yesterday, the Russians released film of three high Mars launchers being destroyed. Two, as I understand it, in the Kherson sector, one, I believe, in the Krasnogorovka area. And three HIMARS launches destroyed in one day. I can remember way back in 2022, lots of uh, bragging in the Western media, um, ridiculed the Russians, ridiculing the Russians for supposedly failing to destroy any HIMARS launches at all, and claiming that when the Russians claimed that they had destroyed high Mars launchers. They'd actually destroyed wooden dummies, <laughs> which um, had been put in their way. Well, that was then. Now, there's no one, I think, seriously doubts that the Russians have destroyed high Mars launchers, three of them in one day. Now, I don't know the size of Ukraine's high Mars arsenal, but I understand that we're talking about perhaps 20 launches in total. I wonder how many of those 20 launches in total or, there, or thereabouts that might have been delivered 
I do wonder how many are left. The Ukrainians, of course, also have multiple launch rocket systems that fire identical rockets to the HIMARS provided by Germany and other countries. These are tracked versions of these launches. But again, I do wonder how many of those are left also. Confirmation of another Abrams tank destroyed in Berdichi. And um, I thought that was the fourth, but I've been corrected. It's actually the third. But still, another of these expensive, symbolically important tanks destroyed. And an S-300 missile system, another S-300 missile system destroyed as well. And again, the Russians have released pictures of this. Now, this is a mounting disaster. Compare that with the fact that apparently, as I understand it, even Oryx is now starting to express scepticism about Ukraine's claims to have shot down multiple numbers of Russian fighter jets and A-50 airborne warning and control aircraft. We have photographic and film confirmation of the systematic destruction by the Russians of Ukrainian air defense assets. And of course, Ukrainian claims by contrast are uncorroborated and unsupported, at least those that relate to the destruction of aircraft. And several people, Dima, specifically at the military summary channel, he's made the point that the reason that the Russians are able to conduct this massive destruction of HIMARS launches, um, air defense assets, um, advanced Western supplied tanks, is because the situation on the contact line is becoming so desperate that the Ukrainians are having to throw everything they have to try to secure their positions there. The Russians, on a normal day, apparently now conduct around 100 air sorties, uh, bombing raids on Ukrainian positions, 100. And the Ukrainians are trying desperately to defend their forces from these bombing raids. So they're deploying their air defense assets dangerously close to the front lines where the Russians are able to track them with their drones and destroy them with their artillery and their missiles and their kamikaze drones, and the Ukrainians are forced also to deploy their best tanks, the Abrams tanks, and the HIMARS to try to stabilize what is now a rapidly deteriorating situation on the front lines. And the Russians, meanwhile, as I said, with this huge drone attack that took place last night, launching attacks, continuing to launch attacks all across Ukraine, and there's rumours that a big missile attack is also coming, and that might very well be only a few days away. Well, what then is the situation on the front lines? And I would say here again, the news for Ukraine is bleak. Firstly, it is confirmed, apparently, that the Russians have indeed broken into the village of Tierny on the Jerebets River. And there is uh, some reports, unconfirmed reports, that they also have captured this village or are largely captured this village and that they're pushing south towards another village called, I believe, Yampol. They seem to be busy rolling up the villages, the Ukrainian villages on the Jerebets River opening up the way for further advances either north towards Kupiansk or perhaps across the Jerebets River towards Liman. 
course, they might decide to do both. There's some reports, again, Dima at the Military Summary Channel discussed them, that the Russians are now apparently finally reactivating their front in Kupiansk. They seem to be um, taking the first, the initial steps to resume their advance towards the Oskol River um, from the village of Tobayevka that they captured some weeks ago and that they seem to be attacking other Ukrainian held villages further north. The Russians have also apparently made significant gains in Krasnogorovka, this small town south of um, uh, to, to, to south of Avdevka, um, which the Russians broke into um, about ten days ago. They appear to have significantly enlarged the territory that they control there, and there are some reports that there's now that the fighting has actually reached the centre of Krasnogorovka itself, though there is no independent confirmation of this, and it is de denied by other sources. There is also apparently an accumulation of reports now, and they seem to be correct, that the Russians have captured large parts of Georgievka, the village to the west of Marinka, that they are um, advancing towards, um, in order, or rather, that they need to take control of in, the, in preparation for a further advance towards the town of Kurakovo, further west. There are also reports that the Russians now are in secure control. In fact, they're not reports, they're confirmed by film, including film of Russian soldiers raising their flag, that the Russians are now in full control of Novo Mikhailovka to the south of Marinka. And in the Berdi in the Avdevka area, fighting continues in Toninka, in uh, Orlovka, in Berdichi. It's generally acknowledged that the Russians um, at the moment are uh, still fighting for control of these villages. It looks as if the Russians were caught by surprise by Sirsky's counterattack over the weekend, as I've discussed in previous programmes, and that they were pushed back in all of these villages. But the Russians appear to be attacking again, and Ukrainian losses are, as I discussed earlier in this programme, incredibly high, 500 men according to the Russian Defence Ministry, killed or wounded in the Avdevka sector over the course of one day. These losses are unsustainable and they are being experienced by the best units of the Ukrainian army. There's also <laughs> reports that the Russians are back in control of the centre of Rabotino in the south and that they have brought under their control more of the fields to the west, to the east of Rabotino in what used to be called Bradley Square. So, terrible outcomes for the Ukrainians right across the front line. They're holding on but at an ever-escalating cost. An escalating cost which is ultimately unsustainable. As I have discussed many times, plays directly into the Russian strategy of aggressive attrition, which the Russian general staff is conducting in Ukraine. And in fact, just to quickly say, just as I've been making uh, this program. I've just seen some further information about the military situation. Um, there are reports now that the Russians control most of Orlovka, uh, 
that the Ukrainians have been pushed back from most of Orlovka, that Toninka, the situation of the Ukrainian forces in Toninka, has become critical, and that the Ukrainians, in order to try to hold their positions in Berdichi, all of these places, obviously, in the Avdevka sector, they sent five of their Abrams tanks to Berdichi, and three of them have been destroyed, and that the Russians are now busy hunting the remaining two, and that they expect to be in full control of Berdichi reasonably soon. So I've just seen that piece of information as I'm making this program. Anyway, there we go. A terrible situation for Ukraine on the battlefronts. I think a wide growing understanding in the West that this is irreversible. Perhaps the first real signs in the United States that they're thinking of walking away from this disaster. The resignation, if we want to call it that, of Victoria Newland, perhaps providing us with a further indication that that might actually be the case. And, of course, panic in Europe um, with all sorts of bizarre ideas floating around. And I get to finish by just mentioning another utterly bizarre piece of news, which I confess I missed or rather misunderstood when it first appeared a couple of days ago, which is that apparently President Zelensky has carried has asked General Sirsky to conduct an audit of the Ukrainian military to find out how many men Ukraine actually has under arms on the battlefronts. And apparently that audit has now reported back that there are 700,000 men missing. Now, I have to say, I find that extraordinary. I find that bizarre. I wonder whether this is actually true or whether it's been misreported or misunderstood. Um, can it really be the case that the Ukrainian army believed it had more than 700,000 men than it actually does? Well, there are, of course, all kinds of explanations as to why, the, why it might be short of 700,000 men. Could it be, for example, that most of these men never existed in the first place, that they are soldiers who were, in theory, on the um, roles of the army and whose salaries were being paid by the United States, by the way, and the European Union, and that what was actually happening was that various corrupt officials along the way were pocketing all that, uh, all, the, all, all those wages. I mean, that's certainly one possibility. Or could it be that amongst these 700,000 missing soldiers are casualties that Ukraine has been careful not to report? Or could it also be that President Zelensky and General Sirsky have come up with this number as part of their campaign, ongoing campaign, to discredit General Zeluzhny um, and to try to imply that General Zeluzhny didn't have proper control of the Ukrainian military and wasn't reporting to the leadership in Kiev what the true situation of the Ukrainian army was. Well, it could be all three, of course, at the same time. The one doesn't exclude the other. But it really is a most astonishing and remarkable claim. And lastly, on the issue of fortifications, the Ukrainian commentator, Yuri Batusov, very stridently patriotic commentator, but increasingly angry and disillusioned. He's now come out and said quite openly that all the talk about fortified lines being built has no reality. Fortifications are not being built in any real sense anywhere 
in Ukraine. And he's, as I understand it, I haven't seen the original of what he said, but as I understand it, he's implying that the money to build these fortifications is being embezzled. Well, on this particular point, I've actually had um, a contribution from a member of the Duran community who's contacted me and he knows an awful lot more about construction than I do. He tells me that it is impossible for Ukraine to build the kind of fortifications it is talking about. He explained to me the number of machines, diggers, the, um, um, that would be needed to do this, which would run in thousands, given the uh, scale of the fortifications that are being talked about. Certainly, if the fortifications are to match those of the Russian-built Surovikin line. He talked to me, he, he's explained the number of um, specialist uh, engineering teams that would be required. He's also spoken about the enormous amounts of equipment that would be needed, um, not just concrete and all of that, but you'd need all kinds of facilities. You'd need, for example, some basic facilities to make sure that the soldiers had some of their essential needs attended to whilst they um, equipped these fortifications. And briefly, and in a most insightful and very interesting way, he's explained why Ukraine simply lacks the resources to build fortifications on the scale and why it is impractical for the European Union, and it can only be the European Union, to supply the necessary uh, diggers and dredgers and uh, cement and all of that um, across the vast distances of Ukraine to do it in Ukraine's place. It would require a colossal commitment of financial and other resources, which the European Union can't realistically undertake. And um, especially in the context of overwhelming Russian air and missile superiority, which would mean that the major fortified lines, uh, wherever they were being built, would at any time be the subject, or could be the subject, of Russian air and missile attacks. I suspect that this could have all been done in the winter of 2022-2023, when there was a brief operational pause in the war. There was the fighting in Bakhmut, but everywhere things were, at that time, fairly stable on the battlefronts. The Russians were still building up their armed forces. The Ukrainians still had most of theirs ready. Uh, the West was supplying the equipment. If there'd been a serious effort then to create fortifications and to use the military equipment that the West was supplying to strengthen those fortifications, then something might have been achieved. But it is too late now and it, it is probably impractical to do. And then lastly, there's been another article in Politico which talks about the immense problems that the F-16 deployments are going to cause, that the logistic problems are enormous, that these are uh, um, fragile and edgy machines, that they need proper runways and proper infrastructure, which still doesn't exist in Ukraine. And anyway, they are being deployed against a background of overwhelming Russian aerial dominance. Frankly, this looks to me like another debacle which is coming, the debacle of the F-16s. Well, there we go. Um, possibly, as I said at the start of this program, indications that the United States, that there's a gradual realisation in the United States that the war is being lost, that the time has come for the U US to edge away. Um, 
perhaps some kind of plan or hope that the Europeans will pick up the slack so that when the collapse comes, all the blame can be shifted on them. Speaker Johnson doing his um, cunning best to deflect the blame from the Republicans and Donald Trump and to shift the agenda back to talk about the border. Donald Trump now certain to be the candidate for the Republican Party's nomination for the presidency. And general confusion and uncertainty about what to do in the West, even as the Russians keep pounding Ukraine and advancing, and even as more and more Ukrainian soldiers die, and as the Ukrainian military gradually gets step by step closer to its ultimate collapse. Well, that's my programme for today. More from me soon. Uh, let me remind you again that you can find all our programmes on our various platforms, Locals, Rumble and X. You can also um, join us. You can also uh, support us via Patreon and Subscribestar. Don't forget, links under this video, don't forget to check out our shop. Uh, check out the amazing things that you will find there, our magic mugs, our hats, our hoodies, our t-shirts, our sweatshirts, all those great things. And last but not least, if you've liked this video, please remember to tick the like button and to check your subscription to this channel. Thank you again. More from me soon. Have a very good day.